So let me ask you, do you have some popcorn? Because this is a very long video. Hello there, my fellow Vault Dwellers and Wasteland Wonders. What's up? It's Robbie with Open World Games, and we've got over 20 minutes worth an interview with the team behind Fallout 4. They're going to go over a bunch of details. So for those of you that don't have time for the full thing, I'm going to try my best to include a video guide in the description below so you can skip ahead to the info you seek. But one thing that did really catch my attention when they were speaking about Fallout 4 was the verticality. This is something that really hasn't been seen much in Fallout games. Uh, Fallout games usually are pretty uh, much very flat in terms of their engagement. So I'm very curious to see what they are talking about here. I would of course assume that they are referring to the jetpack that is part of the power armor. And then of course the airships which will be dominating the skies of Boston. But guys, without further ado, here is the 20 minute special. Enjoy! How's it going? Uh, I'm Matt from Bethesda, and we're here with uh, Bethesda Game Studios. These guys have actually all worked on the game, uh, the Fallout series, for over 10 years together. Uh, we've got the art director, Isvan Pele. Hello. Lead producer, Jeff Gardner. Lead writer, Emil Pagliarulo. And you guys don't need to welcome, or you know who he is. Yeah, you, let's welcome him. Here's Todd Howard, the game director of Fallout 4. So uh, the game was announced about two weeks ago. Uh, we showed it at the showcase at E3. How are you guys coming along with the game? Uh, great. You know, we're, we're where we need to be. There's a, there's a lot to do yet. We build really, really big games, but, um, you know, we... We make the games that we want to play, and it's a blast to play, and we are really excited to, to get it out to everybody. You know, and the, the joke that you, when you tell someone you're a video game developer, and, oh, you play games all day. You know, no. So three and a half years, you're not playing games all day. You're making them. But now it's sort of the, the part of the project where you are playing the game all day, trying to, you know, play it and test it and fix it and get it where it's supposed to be. So. I've played the game probably 400 hours, and I'm still finding stuff that I haven't seen yet. <laughs> Surprises. Yeah, this is my favorite part of the project, is when it all starts coming together, it's clicking. So much fun. We're having a blast. I think that's one thing people don't realize, is they think like uh, that we know everything in the game. Like You think, like, I would know everything in the game. I actually don't. <laughs> Because there, we have a, a, a studio that's worked together for a long time. I know most stuff in the game, but like I'll be playing the game and run into something and be like, who built this? What is this? Because it's so big. And then, you know, I think collectively we all know everything in the game, but usually we'll ask each other. What do you really think makes this feel like a new Fallout uh, since the last one you put out? I think, you know, for, for every game we, we step back and we look at, not as a sequel, but like what makes this Fallout? What is the essence of Fallout? So, you know, this is something where we step back and it's, we're constantly reinventing things. And so this is a whole new take, a whole new vision. Well, I grew up in Boston, so for me, the Fall 4 has an entirely different meaning. You know, it has a very personal connection to me. It has a lot of different tones through the world because it can be very scary, um, and then it can get kind of, at times, almost B-movie goofy, but it all kind of works together. In Fallout 3, I think the people who live in that world are very cognizant of they're in this destroyed world, you know? And so we, we looked at that again and tried to think, well, what if... You know, it's not so much about the past. You know, this is what they know. This is the, their world. So there's a little bit of, you know, you know, there's a post-apocalypse in a destroyed world, but there's a glimmer of hope sometimes, too, because there are people that are getting on with their lives. And how do you look at that, too, and how does that, you know, inform the different stories in the world? So, Isvan, when uh, the team was finishing up Skyrim uh, in 2011, you were actually actually putting stuff in the world already. Uh, what was that like, kind of being the first guy on the uh, the front line? Yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, I went straight into this game right after Fallout 3 was finished, and after we had finished all the DLC. So I was still very much fresh on just having completed that project and deciding, like, all right, what do we want to do this time um, that's different? We want to keep things fresh. We don't want to repeat ourselves. Fallout 3 had a very distinct visual style. It kind of, you know, you look at a screenshot, a video from it, you can easily identify it, but... This time we kind of went back and sort of looked at it, and a lot of it for me was, okay, what is Fallout? Look back at Fallout 1, like what are, what are some of the vibes you want to sort of carry over? So we looked at, 
you know, introducing more color, more variety in the world. There isn't sort of a, a tonal grading over the whole game visually this time. You, know, you look back at original games, the vibrancy of the vault suit, that color blue, the way it pops on screen, these color we had accents. a lot of blue debates. Yeah, yeah. very specific. <laughs> a lot of color, color debates. How, <laughs> how blue is your game? How blue is blue? That isn't bright green. It's more yeah. Yeah. The exact color green for, for the interface, all those little details. So it you know, it's going back and trying to find what the essence of the original game was and um, trying to keep it fresh, trying to do something new. Do you remember what the first thing you did for the project was? Yeah, I think originally, you know, for one of the things we want to do with this game is is really look at doing a post apocalyptic city, Boston, uh, trying to doing a really dense, realistic, large city. This is one gonna be one of our most um, richly detailed and dense environments that we've, we've ever done. So a lot of it was, for me, looking at doing a small vertical slice. What's, what's that going to feel like? Introducing new elements we haven't seen much of before, more verticality in the environments. And we had a lot of conversations early on, too, with, with the environment and the location to be recognizable, right? And DC is easy. You know, you've got the, the Washington Monument, the Capitol Building. And so that was part of a was talking about, you know, what is it visually about Boston that stands out, too, that separates it from another city? You know, red brick streets and a lot of, you know, classic architecture that sort of... Fenway Park. That stuck out a lot. Too. Yeah, Fenway we Park. we got to get Fenway in there in the right way. Yeah. yeah. When, when did you guys kind of get to the decision that was going to be the, the next Fallout location? We debated for a while. Um, we, had, we had had some seeds in Fallout 3, and uh, we felt that Boston was kind of the right... It's got the right mix of like American history mixed with high tech. It's very good for Fallout. Plus, uh, it doesn't hurt that Emil it grew up there, so uh, you know his he could talk more about it. Yeah, well, I, I remember the conversation with it. I remember the moment actually when we decided the game would be in Boston. It was Todd and Eastvine and I in Eastvine's office, and they were talking. And I'm thinking in, in my head like. Are, are they going towards Boston? This is what I'm hearing. Like, we're all sort of talking and about it. you didn't it. want to oversell it. Yeah, like, that's the thing. Like, I didn't want to be like, yeah, let's put the game in Boston. And so uh, we finally decided, let's, you know, set it in Boston. And Todd just turns to me and says, I, is that okay with you? And I'm like, all right. Now, now we're talking. Yeah. As a developer, as a designer, you know, and you're making the game, Boston, they call Boston America's walking city. You know, and so there's a lot you can you you can fly into Logan Airport and you go downtown Boston. You can see a lot in a very short amount of time, and so I'm walking around in the game and I'm you know I've gotten homesick. You know, I'm like this is so this reminds me exactly like oh this is here. You Does know, it look the same. My <laughs> <laughs> ouch. Uh, yeah, um, my house is in the game destroyed. So wow, single tier. It's also a very visually intriguing environment too because. Boston has so much character. It's got a very specific look to it, all the red brick and whatnot. And introducing the fall elements to that visually in terms of like the high tech, the, the skyscrapers, the, you know, the more futurism, blending the futurism with sort of the historical colonial quality to it, that was very exciting to try to figure that out. So you t created a ton of work for this. Um, I think we've got some footage of actually uh, the concept art that went into creating all this. So Todd, I think you you go into this that it's every every little detail in the game is uh, is important, even from every yeah. monitor in the game. You know, we always say that. I, I don't. I think it's hard for people who play our games to, you know, wish they could be a fly on the wall in the office sometimes and see just how obsessive we get over all the details. Um, you know, <laughs> we're not showing all the concept art here. We just possibly, you know, we can. But the, 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 those the lights there really are. I really like those images because it's almost symbolic to this like obsession with like, what are the labels on these blinky lights and like on every computer in this area, because someone, you know, we like people to be able to stick their noses in it, and so, um, despite it being like, and again, a lot of times our stuff maybe feels really everything feels really grand, but we're also a first person game, yeah. So we need to hold up at both scales that you can stick your nose in it. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, credit to our artists. They are, they are amazing. Yeah, our concept artists are fantastic. And, and because of, you know, the unique nature of Fallout, like, everything has to be designed. Every vehicle, every prop in the world, the architecture, it does so much, so much we have to draw to cover for artists to build them. Um, yeah, and you see a fraction of it here. I almost think this video, it may, may even do a better job than the footage we put out of showing you the different styles and palettes of what you're going to see in the, in the game world. 
we actually go back to some of these environments after we built them, paint them over again, and then redo them in the game just to make sure it's, everything's perfect, the lighting and the shadow and how everything interchange, interplays. Yeah, yeah, early on, there, was, there were one or two concepts that you know I think um, the artist Rifton just came up, uh, coming up with, I think, like a city street, and we were like, well, could we actually do that in the game? And we had it, it wasn't the way we built spaces before, and we actually ended up changing our process a little bit to make some of these, real, like, doing architecture like that and destroyed, showing destruction in a different way. Yeah. And the big thing we do, and th this was tricky with what uh, you know, Eastvon was building originally, is that we have a lot more non-loading space because it's all destroyed, so it's harder to do, like, here's a big castle gate, and you click it. So, like, we wanted these really crenulated buildings and with the light coming through it, and so... Um, the concept artist could draw really crazy stuff like that, and you know, with the new consoles and the memory and the tech, we're able to build these things where it's, it's a lot more free flowing. Particularly, you know, downtown was the biggest struggle, technically, to get going at the detail level we wanted. The the building of settlements and the weapon customization that seems pretty crazy and ambitious for you guys. I think we have some footage of that right here. So did uh, did uh, Hearthfire play a big part into this? Uh, from Skyrim, or was it just something you wanted to do all along? I wouldn't say. We, we do a little bit of this in, in all the games we do. So, um, when we were, when, when, when Hearthfire was being made, we knew we were, you know, doing this, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say one had anything to do with the other. It's just, um, this one is completely, it's a completely different animal. So, this really became like, we'd like to do it. Can we even do it? Um, and I, I think the, um, the inspirations are pretty clear here, things like Minecraft and other games that, that we like, um, and that we could do it really well in a world like Fallout. Uh, and, and I, you know, I remember discussions, actually, because Jeff and Todd and I, I think our kids were playing Minecraft around the same time, so we would have these discussions about, like, what are our kids playing? What are they creating? And, you know, and... Um, yeah, Terraria I, was another one. Yeah, right. Where people will come to your, you know... And one of our artists made that. I just thought it was so awesome. Uh, it's like we got to put that in the video. Like that was that's not. He built that, and then you know set up all the. You can set up the wires and, and control them. Uh, one of the things we don't show because it's, you know, we couldn't get in the video. Is he he made a music player too. Like you can make things that play audio tunes and then plug the terminal in and adjust the pitch, and so. That's the visual programming, kind of being able to do that, or how's that work? Yeah, because we have terminals in Fallout, we can kind of get away with like pseudo scripting without you getting in and modding and scripting, because you can build a terminal and then access everything on it. And so, as the artists and the other designers make new things, they give them properties, and those properties will feed back to the terminal, and you can see those. So, like, you know, we're. we're it works well in the game, but we're more excited to like get it out to everybody and then see what see what they make with it. Because you look at what people do with Minecraft, just with basic timers and switches and redstone, it's pretty it's bonkers. So working on the project, Jeff, uh, does it feel like you're a parent or an overseer, making sure all this stuff's getting done uh, to hit the hit the release date? In, in some regards, I have five children, so it's not nearly as difficult as that, honestly. But um, <laughs> one's enough for me yeah, right now. Yeah. Um, they're wonderful. Um, but, the, uh, you know, like I said, we are blessed to work with some of the best professionals in this industry. We're still sort of a scrappy team in a way. You know, we're just over 100 people, not nearly as big as some of the other studios. So we're able to really have great rapport, an individual rapport with most, you know, all our de developers and really get like this great, I, I hate the word synergy, but that's what it is, going between different departments. And we empower people to do what they love when they come to our work. And they're really like... You know, what, what can you contribute today? It's not like we hand them a task sheet or anything along those right. lines. And like, we find surprises all the time in the game, and those are generally, for us, some of the best things in the game. Like, we've been working together, you know, for 10 years on the Fallout series, right? But that's representative of the company, too. Like, a lot, most of the people at Bethesda have been there for a long time, so we've worked... A lot of people, most of the people on the team, have been working with them for years, so you get to know them. There's a certain flow and energy and, you know, and just, just you know, how they work. Um, and how, how to communicate effectively with them. And it, it People see the end result of what we do, but we're coming to the office for four years, and we spend a lot of time together. Um, and that's, you know, I think our creative energies together, everybody in the team, that really shows through in the game. Uh, one of the things people have been talking about a lot since uh, you showed the game is the voice protagonist in the game. Uh, where'd you come to that decision to use that? 
we wanted to tell this big epic story and you know and do that in a way that let the player sort of um, relay emotion and have these emotional moments. And there's we realized you know there's only so you know if you play Fallout 3, you know Liam Neeson is the voice of your dad, and there are some good emotional beats there, but there's only so much you can do when you're just clicking on a, a, a line of dialogue and there's no spoken response and you can't... So the emotional depth that we got by having the voice protagonist had just w actually way more, way more intense than I even expected, like the advantages of it. Yeah, some of that was logistical. You know, can we... Uh, right. We didn't want it to hold back what we would usually do with, yeah. you know, uh, all of the choice we want. So, you know, they have spent years on it each of them have recorded over 13,000 lines. Um, and also we found, you know, uh, we found two great voice actors uh, for the male and the female players. Yeah. Well, Todd, could, can you believe it? We actually have them here. I can believe it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'd like to welcome to the stage uh, voice actors Brian T. Delaney, uh, Courtney Taylor, and voice director Kal Kalel Bogdanovich. <laughs> How'd I do? <laughs> Not well. So welcome, guys. It's pretty exciting to have you guys. And, and I guess Courtney wasn't able to make it. Wait, yeah, she's, yep. she's lost somewhere in the uh, electronic miasma. Yeah. <laughs> try and get her here. Okay. So how did you guys get started on the project? I remember. I looked it up. And, uh, July 9th, 2013 was my first day of work. And uh, I remember I knew this was going to be a big deal, but... Uh, but I, I didn't know the game title. I only knew the code name. <laughs> so we show up, and I do the first line, which happens to be War, War Never Changes. And I, I say, uh, Cal, just so, uh, can, they, can you tell me what the name of the game is? And he says, well, yeah, you know, it's, you know, the line. <laughs> right, the line, of course. Right. <laughs> Stupid, yeah, I know. I didn't. So when he told me and, and the scope of the game and what they were doing and what Todd and the team were doing, uh, it kind of blew me away, even more so than when I first found out I booked the job, so. It's pretty cool. Cool. What are some uh, unique characteristics of working on a project this this massive uh, compared to other things you've worked on? The the number one difference between this and the many other games that I've worked on is the amount of uh, time and care that has gone into the writing and then the recording of this material. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about this, but in a lot of other games, AAA games, they'll wait till like the last month or two to record everything for the game, and it's a huge rush, and sometimes you're doing like 100 lines an hour, and it's nuts. Um, to have had the uh, artistic luxury of being able to work on this with these two, unfortunately Courtney's not here, these two incredibly talented actors for as long as we have, almost three years, definitely three by the time uh, it launches, is just, um, it, it shows a, an attention to detail and um, a respect for the material and for the audience that you just don't see elsewhere. It's really extraordinary. Yeah, and for you guys, what's it been like working with them? Awesome, you know, it's, uh, again, that goes back to, if we're gonna really do this the way we want, we need to logistically figure out how we can record voice for four years. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, Cal came in early. We did some, uh, we also, there's some performance capture we do in the game. So there's that, that part of it as well. And we were anxious, you know, about having a voice because, like, it changes, like, how do I feel about my character? Um, and when we heard Brian and Courtney, uh, and we obviously, we, we, we auditioned a ton of people. I don't know if you know how know many. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, oh, yeah. Get out, really? Uh, oh. oh, yeah. I but mean, you were number one. <laughs> um, and we'd have team voting. So we would, we would put up various pictures of different character faces and make everybody in the team, you don't know, okay, everybody in the team listen to them. And like, okay, because sometimes you get a good, a good voice, but he doesn't feel right to everybody. And it was like a, uh, you know, um, Courtney! Courtney! Taylor, Courtney's yay! here! Yay! <laughs> Courtney Taylor! <laughs> this was a late idea, by the way, everybody. Like, oh, you should come. It'll be, it'll be great. <laughs> um, but anyway, finding them really made it made uh, all the difference. And it's weird, actually. Today was the first day I actually met face to face. I know. Um, and like I've been listening to his voice as the character, and they both have really owned the characters yeah. for years, and it um, it got better and better and better. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Emil can speak to it too. Well, he does most of the writing. You know, you you talk about well, so there. You know, you can play the game as a, a female protagonist or a male protagonist, and you. Um, 
so everything, so either gender can do everything in the game, right? So, and it was, it was really cool to, for me to see the differences in the lines and, the, and um, the things that Brian brought and the things that Courtney brought were sometimes completely different. Like I would write them a certain way or the, or the designers would write the, these things a certain way and you would expect a certain performance and then they would deliver something way beyond what you even expected. And so that, and that actually happened very early. And that, you know, I spoke earlier of trust. It establishes trust with, you know, when you have this very emotional st story and the trust you have to have that these, you know, these folks are gonna knock it out of the park. Uh, it, it just, uh, the, the recording sessions almost became conversational, you know what I mean? Just like, let's go in, let's do it, you know? And the communication to be able to talk to these guys and Cal about, that's not working, can we try it this way? Uh, it, yeah, world of difference. Well, we're, we're actually running out of time here. Thanks everybody for showing. Brian, I have one request for you. Uh, maybe you could give the whole audience a let's go, pal. Let's go, pal. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>